Hello everybody and welcome to another uncanny episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is brought to you in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to help decide what topics get covered on the channel and get your name in the special thanks at the end of each episode, you can sign up for as little as $1 per month over at patreon.com slash marymarvelate. The link is in the description below. I've got a weird one for you this week, folks. Mort, the Dead Teenager, was a four-issue miniseries published in 1993 and 1994. While the titular character has not appeared outside of that outlandishly comedic book, he did get a brief entry in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe in 2010, suggesting that the following events did indeed occur in some form in the Marvel canon. The character in question, Mort Graves, was born and raised in Mistake Beach on Long Island. The son of Bruce and Wendy Graves, he had an older sister named Cindy, and a brother, Kyle. His two best friends were Reardon Weedlow and George Slickowski, better known as Weirdo and Slick. And like many teenagers, Mort had a crush, specifically on a popular girl named Kimberly Dimmenmine. Of course, she was already involved with the hotshot jock, Lance Boyle. Regardless, Mort was so enamored with Kimberly that he ignored the advances of the more tomboyish Maureen Redding. Anyway, if you've looked at the title of the video, you can probably guess that things soon went sideways for Mort Graves. The story really kicks off when he borrowed his father's Studebaker and drove off to the convenience corner in an attempt to impress Kimberly. In his infinite wisdom, he decided to challenge her boyfriend to a street race, with the finish line being the railroad crossing. Naturally, Lance's newer vehicle quickly outpaced the restored antique, but that wasn't the worst part. One part of the old car that hadn't been fully restored were the brakes. Unable to stop, Mort drove out onto the train tracks just as the Babylon Express came hurtling down the line, resulting in a collision that totaled the car and proved deadly for Mort. However, this was not truly the end for him as he dropped into an otherworldly afterlife. There, he encountered a being known as Teen Death, who claimed to be the son of the cosmic abstract Death. Uh, apparently, heaven was closed for repairs and hell was full, and so people like Mort, who weren't particularly good or bad, were either left trapped in limbo, reincarnated as a cockroach, or sent back to Earth as a ghost. That last option was the fate chosen for Mort, sent back to frighten people into better appreciating their own lives. In this new undead form, Mort was a ghostly white and his head was easily removable. His sister didn't seem overly perturbed by this, however, and wasn't even attending his funeral. As it turns out, Mort's parents borrowed money from his brother to pay for a bare-bones service, complete with a cardboard coffin. However, Kimberly did arrive to pay her respects and admit her love, as did Maureen, who dropped a single six-pack of beer into his grave. In any event, when Mort's father found out that his house was haunted by his own son, he was more concerned with the property value than anything else. Well, that and the fact that he'd also wrecked the Studebaker while getting himself killed. Mort didn't really plan on doing much actual haunting, but he did discover that his brother Kyle had claimed all of his possessions since he'd offered them as collateral for an earlier loan. Among them were tickets to a white metal mania concert, which is what he'd used the loan money for in the first place, but Kyle had already sold the tickets to Slick and Weirdo. Since the concert was on that same night, Mort assumed that that was the reason that his friends didn't show up to his funeral. Meanwhile, Weirdo and Slick convinced two women to accompany them by claiming that they were roadies with the band. However, the girls quickly ran off when Mort arrived to torment his friends. Following this, he attempted to fulfill his ghostly duties, haunting a movie theater and emerging from the screen with a chainsaw. But the desensitized audience believed him to be some kind of special effect and were unimpressed. Mort also saw Lance making out with Kimberly in the cinema and threatened to go all Leatherface on his ass. But Teen Death grabbed him and pulled him back down into the netherworld, warning him that he'd need to step up his haunting game if he didn't want to suffer a fate even worse than death. 
Mort's ghostly form was then booted back to Earth, but this time he was invisible to everyone around him. Landing back at school, he saw that a psychiatric professional had been assigned to his homeroom to help his classmates cope with his loss. While many of them didn't even know who he was, Kimberly had written a poem in his memory. But Maureen struck her in the head with a spitball, chastising Kimberly for only ever being sympathetic to Mort after he died. I also want to note that the second issue of Mort the Dead Teenager here makes continual reference to the Kalakak brothers. While it's clear from context that the brothers are in fact characters within the story, the name is a direct reference to the Kalakak family, a 1912 book by American eugenicist Henry Goddard attempting to argue for the hereditary nature of what he called feeble-mindedness. So that's... uncomfortable. Anyway, Kyle tried to convince Mort to posthumously settle their debts by blackmailing him with a photo of him making out with the Kalakak's sister, Roxy, after junior prom. You know, I'm starting to see why nobody really talks about this book. Moving on from that, Slick and Weirdo were holding auditions for their band, Positive Feedback, but without much success. However, Maureen applied, and as it turns out, was rather skilled on the guitar, even though she hadn't owned an electric one before. But complicating matters, Kimberly also applied, proving herself a competent singer, if not a masterful songwriter. But Mort, apparently able to read his mind, could tell that Slick was fantasizing about Kimberly. Wanting to sabotage the band before it got started, he entered the amplifier and released an electoplasmic shock. However, the resulting boom actually convinced Slick's father of the band's potential, and he volunteered to bankroll and manage them. They subsequently played at ABCDs, a rock and roll club in the Bowery, where Mort tried to sabotage them by frightening the audience. However, they were also the last act on a Wednesday night, so they didn't exactly have an audience. Visible again, Mort flew all the way back to Long Island, which proved to be more difficult than he imagined. Tired of being a ghost, he confronted a teen death, demanding to know how to be truly resurrected. However, the pubescent cosmic abstract retaliated by showing Mort that there were worst forms to be in after one's death, briefly transforming him into ectoplasmic slime. Then, after restoring Mort to a semi-solid state, Teen Death showed him a variety of different possible futures if he hadn't died. In one, he worked a menial job at a car wash until war broke out with Canada. He was subsequently drafted into the Toronto Offensive, but unfortunate friendly fire resulted in permanent brain damage. In another timeline where he actually studied for the SAT, he would have become the manager of the car wash, working under his brother Kyle. He married Kimberly, but was generally left to care for their three children and his invalid parents and grandfather. In that timeline, Maureen was an international rock star and engaged to Slick, who was also her manager. Meanwhile, despite being a successful businessman, Weirdo would crank, call Mort, and mess with him. Ultimately, Weirdo bought the car wash from Kyle, and Mort was left a lowly dryer in that timeline, too. In yet another timeline, Mort cheated on his SAT, earned a scholarship, and subsequently completed a degree in aeronautical engineering. While this kept him off the front lines in the war with Canada, the job market still left him working at the car wash alongside Slick, who'd caught a piece of shrapnel in his brain during a battle in Saskatchewan. In that timeline, Mort was still married to Kimberly, but she cleared out the house and ran off with Lance, who owned a chain of drive-in proctology clinics. But rather than sadness, Mort felt like he'd been set free to pursue his dreams. He joined the Merchant Marines, jumped ship to Bombay, and climbed a mountain. But he was then abducted by a yeti and brought to a hidden monastery. There, he met a wise old sage called the Rama Lama, who offered him either the secret to eternal happiness or a big bag of gold. Mort took the gold and used it to buy the fastest car in the world. He nearly became the new NASCAR champion, but the race was interrupted by aliens from Uranus. Oh, and his sister Cindy was a successful crystal aura reader and numerology consultant. Anyway, after showing him these potential futures, Teen Death insisted that any of them would be preferable to non-existence, and booted Mort's ghostly form back to Earth once again. 
Mort soon discovered that Weirdo's family had been financially ruined by their investment into the band. Weirdo intended on throwing himself off of a bridge and ended up falling, but both the water and the drop were too shallow to cause any real harm. Slick lost his passion for music entirely, instead of joining his parents in their science fiction obsessions. Maureen sold both her bike and her guitar to reinvent herself with a new image. She started dating Lance, who it seems also made attempts to better himself. Kimberly, meanwhile, got together with a sound guy at ABCDs and started performing poetry there. And just when Mort began to question if there was any rhyme or reason to anything that had been happening in his entire afterlife, he woke up. Yeah, cue Jonathan Frakes telling us that this was a total fabrication because apparently everything that happened since the day of Mort's death was just a dream. Although it seems the teenager may not have taken any actual lessons from what he'd seen, and again prepared to take his father Studebaker to try and impress Kimberly at the convenience corner, just like this all started with. Meanwhile, Teen Death started preparing the train, the Babylon Express, for its journey, so... Perhaps it wasn't all just a dream. But that is the story of Mort, the dead teenager. Neither he nor Teen Death have made any subsequent appearances since then, but if Brute Force can make a comeback, perhaps they can too. Speaking of characters with surprise comebacks, do you remember how back in October we recapped several stories from the 1950s horror anthology Menace? One of the stories we talked about there featured a criminal named Harry Sykes. While evading the police, he stumbled upon a scientist who'd invented a serum granting immortality, and stole it for himself before anyone else could take it. Although he'd become unkillable while hiding in the bayou, Harry Sykes mistakenly stepped in quicksand and sank down into the mud. What I neglected to report in that video is that he didn't actually stay there forever. After being trapped for decades, he was fished out by mercenaries working for a man known as Windsor, who was collecting seemingly unkillable specimens. Being buried there for all that time, it left him in a state of insanity, and Sykes was let loose against Wolverine, only to have his limbs sliced off. But at the end of the day, his mind and body both eventually recovered, and Harry Sykes remained with several other unkillables to form a band of freelance problem solvers. For the full story there, you can check out the 2011 series Wolverine, the best there is, but that's all I've got for you this week. If you enjoyed this video, or at least thought it was entertainingly weird, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next, and as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month, you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!